God is the God of second chances, new beginnings, and fresh starts. God is the God of glory days. And if you could use some glory days, then welcome to this study of the book and the life of Joshua, the most famous mulligan in all of history, was given to the children of Israel, a second chance to enter the promised land. Joshua and his people took it. And if you're ready to move into your promised land, then his story is for you. The words to our Glory Days declaration are going to appear on the screen. I want you to fill your lungs with air and your hearts with hope. And I don't want you to say this unless you really mean it. You ready? Here they are. These days are glory days. So, Lord, have mercy upon us now. Open our hearts up to receive your teaching. You know how weak and sinful your teacher is. Have mercy upon him. Grant, Lord God, that we could walk away with a blessing today, something new, a revelation, an understanding, a knowledge that we did not have when we came in. We stand down the evil one in the name of Jesus Christ. He has no place here. And we welcome your work, Holy Spirit. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, I want to take just a couple of minutes before I begin our message on Jericho to talk to you about a question that always surfaces anytime any of us study the book of Joshua. And that has to do with the destruction of the Canaanites. The book of Joshua is a bloody book. It does no good to pretend it isn't. Not only is something evil happening the killing of large hordes of people. But that evil is happening to women, children, even animals. It's a difficult thought. And for many readers, this violence is a barrier to studying Joshua or to even understanding the character and heart of God. So it's a good question. How are we to respond to the taking of lives in the taking of the land? Well, some people try to get out of this puzzle by saying God didn't really even command these things, that Joshua needed a new hearing aid, that, that he misunderstood what God was saying. It's nearly impossible to go this route and maintain any sense of inspiration of Scripture. God's instructions are so clear. So what are we to do? Well, a couple of thoughts have helped me. First, God knew the Canaanite people. More specifically, he knew how evil they were. He knew their unbridled violence. And he knew it 600 years before the events that we read about in the book of Joshua took place. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 16 has God telling Abram, before he was Abraham, in the fourth generation your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites, which is another name for the Canaanites, has not yet reached its full measure. In other words, God could see the evil of the Amorite people coming. And so he gave them six centuries, six centuries, 600 years to change their ways. We know had they changed their ways, he would have received them. We know that because of the story of Rahab in Joshua chapter 2. When she changed her way, God received her. And had the people changed their ways, God would have received them. But they did not. Apparently, they grew more evil with each generation. Deuteronomy 12, 31 says this about the people. They do all kinds of detestable things the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifices to gods. Eugene Peterson, many of you read the Peterson translation of the Bible. He says, the Canaan of the 13th century B.C. was a snake pit of child sacrifice and sacred prostitution. People who were ruthlessly devoted to using the most innocent and vulnerable members of the community, babies and virgins, to manipulate God or gods for gain. God saw this. He not only saw what they had done, but omniscient God saw what they would do. He knew what would happen if their evil was left unchecked. So he punished them. In punishing them, he protected 
people. He protected the planet. He protected the promised land. He protected the promised people. And he protected the promised child. I know it's a severe punishment. But I would also remind us that many times children don't understand the severity of their parents' actions. They don't understand the actions that their parents take to protect their children. I have a friend who has a, or whose daughter, when she was a teenager, had a toxic boyfriend. He was influencing her in every way that was bad. Uh, through his influence, her thoughts became dark and plagued. It was as if the boy had cast a spell over his daughter. So he demanded that they break up, that she not see him. She refused. They continued to see each other. And finally, he took the desperate act of resigning from his job, putting his house on the market, and telling his family that they were going to move just to separate her from him. Her response to her father was, that's an overreaction. I'm sure she thought it was. But in his mind, it was a necessary protection. To those who would read the book of Joshua and say God's response was an overreaction, I would be quick to say, we just don't know. We don't know how evil the people were. We don't know how unfairly, how cruel they would have been to other generations. We also need to remember that God is God. And only he knows and only he understands. And lastly, we need to remember that God is a God of grace. This is the only book, the only book in the Bible where God's people are called to take such aggressive action. Every other instance, God's people are called to be merciful, to be kind. And God himself is a God of redemption who displays power, patience, and love. He has page after page earned our trust and displayed his character as a God of grace. It's up to you to wrestle with this thought on your own, but this is how I've wrestled with it, and I hope it's helpful. By the way, God will someday do this again. He will punish all that is evil, and he will bring an end to the devil and his angels and his followers, and I believe on that day no one will question his right to do so. So now let's begin our study of Joshua chapter 6, the story of the walls of Jericho and their collapse. Here's what you need to know about the walls of Jericho. They were immense. They wrapped around the city like an armored plate, two concentric circles of stone rising 40 feet above the ground. They were impenetrable. Here's what you need to know about Jericho's inhabitants, ferocious and barbaric. They had withstood all sieges. They had repelled all invaders. They would stand on the ramparts and rain arrows down on their attackers. They were a Bronze Age version of the Nazi army, tyrants on the plains of Canaan. Until the day Joshua showed up. Until the day his army marched in, until the day the stones began to crack and the bricks began to break, until the day that everything shook, the stones of the walls, the knees of the kings, the molars of the soldiers, and the untoppable fortress met the unstoppable force, and mighty Jericho crumbled." But here's what you need to know about Joshua. He didn't bring the walls down. I know the old spiritual says otherwise. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho. You know it. <laughs> We've sung it. But we sing wrongly. Joshua did not fight this battle. Joshua never bared a sword. He never swung a hammer. His men never dislodged a brick. They never rammed a door. They never pried loose a stone. This shaking, this quaking, this rumbling and tumbling, God did that for them. And listen to me. God will do this for you. Your Jericho is your fear. Your Jericho is your guilt. Your Jericho is your anxiety. Your Jericho is your negativity, your proclivity to criticize, overanalyze, compartmentalize. Your Jericho is that outlook, that attitude, that stronghold that keeps you from moving in to the life as God has ordained it. 
Your Jericho keeps you from joy, from peace, steals your sleep at night. It messes up your relationships. And it stands between you and your glory days. And to enter into your glory days, Jericho must come down. To inherit your land, you must face Jericho, and its walls must fall. And here's what you need to do. Believe in God's power. As you read Joshua chapter 6, it opens with the story of the Lord saying to Joshua, See, I have seen, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. God did not say, Joshua, take the city. God did say, Joshua, I have taken the city. Now receive it. Joshua did not go forth hoping to win. Joshua knew God had already won. You do not fight for victory. You fight from victory. And God does not say to you, Bob, I want you to break those bad habits. God says to you, Bob, I have broken the power of those bad habits over your life. Now walk in faith with me. Receive the blessing of my victory. Everything begins right here with this belief in your new identity, trusting what happened to you on the day you crossed over Jordan or you stepped into faith. And what happened then is you became a co-heir with Christ, not a marginalized citizen of heaven, but you became a co-heir of Christ. Every blessing of Christ is at your disposal. Was Christ victorious in his life? Will you be victorious in your life? Did Christ overcome sin and death? So will you overcome sin and death? The question is not, will you overcome? The question is simply, when will you overcome? It's learning to walk in power, walk in faith, anticipating that it's just a matter of time before yet another Jericho comes down. Satan lost all rights to you at the cross. Jesus disarmed the devil. The enemy is now defeated. He is humiliated. And consequently, today's problems are not necessarily tomorrow's problems. Today's hang-ups are not necessarily tomorrow's hang-ups. Today's addictions are not necessarily tomorrow's addictions. Stop self-labeling. I'm just a worrier. Pornography is my weakness. My dad was a drinker and a drunk. I guess I'm just destined to carry on the family tradition. You stop that. Stop it. Those kind of words form an alliance with the devil. They allow him an access into your spirit. Don't barter with him. Don't agree with him. You are not destined to defeat. You're a child of God. You're not destined to depression. You're not assigned a life of poverty and sorrow. It is not God's will that you lead a joyless, marginalized, defeated, unhappy, and weary life. It is time to turn a deaf ear to the old voices and begin hearing and receiving these new choices. Like the psalmist said, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a beautiful inheritance. Live out of your inheritance as a co-heir with Christ. Trusting God is your first step. Now, fighting with God's weapons is the second step. I can picture the soldiers of Joshua perking up as their commander announced, it's time to take Jericho. Oh, man, good. We're going to go get our swords, get our spears. We're going to scale the walls. Which side do we attack first, Joshua? And Joshua looked at the men and he said, well, God has a different strategy. And he ordered the most unlikely of attacks. He said, take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark 
of the Lord. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant was the presence of God. And so he told soldiers to march in front of and behind the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant and blasting ram's horns. As for the rest of the people, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout, then you shall shout. So the priests would blow these trumpets continually as the soldiers and the priests marched around the city once a day. No hand-to-hand combat, no flashing swords, no flying spears, no battering rams, no catapults, just ram's horns, priests marching in silence. Now, Joshua has at least 40,000 soldiers at his command, and he tells them to be quiet and watch. What kind of warfare is this? It's spiritual warfare. Every battle, ultimately, is a spiritual battle. Every conflict, ultimately, is a conflict with Satan and his forces. For that reason, the Scripture urges us, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Stronghold, that's a very important word in our Christian vocabulary. The word stronghold appears about 50 times in the Bible, typically referring to a fortress, a tall or inaccessible or a difficult fortress. King David called the city of Jerusalem a fortress when he first saw it perched up on the hill. The Apostle Paul uses this term fortress to describe not a building made of bricks, but a thought process, a mindset, an attitude. Again, the verse, the weapons of our warfare are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. There's a definition of a stronghold. It's an, it's, it's an argument. It, it's, a, it's a thought process. It's an attitude. It's a mindset. It's a high thing. It exalts itself against the knowledge of God. In other words, it competes. It competes with the truth about the character of God. It seeks to deny the truth about God. It sets itself up against the knowledge of who God is. Other translations use words like this for a stronghold. Imaginations, King James Version. Pretensions, New International Version. Lofty opinion, English Standard Version. Warped philosophy, the message. So a stronghold is any mindset, any thought pattern, any attitude, any conviction that sets itself up against God. A mindset is a false premise that denies God's promise. A mindset is a false premise, a philosophy that denies God's promise, the truth. Examples of strongholds. God could never forgive me. That's the stronghold of guilt. That's a false premise. I could never forgive him. Well, you may feel that, but that's not true. You could. But that's a stronghold of resentment. Bad things always happen to me. That's a false premise. They don't. But you can begin believing that and make decisions accordingly. That's a stronghold of self-pity. I have to be in charge. You don't. That's false. That's the stronghold of pride. I don't deserve to be loved. That's a lie. You do deserve to be loved. You're special in God's sight. But that's a stronghold of rejection. I'll never recover. The stronghold of defeat. I must be good or God will reject me. The stronghold of legalism or performance. 
I'm only as good as I look or only as good as what I possess, the stronghold of appearance, the stronghold of materialism. These are strongholds. And unless you take the offensive against the stronghold, this stronghold will dominate the landscape of your promised land, and you'll never press forward. Unless you learn to deny the false, untrue premise and learn to stand on the divine promise, you'll always have one leg in the wilderness and one leg in the promised land. So if you're ready to move forward, you learn to work with in God's power to bring down these strongholds. So Paul says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. In other words, we don't just grit our teeth and redouble our efforts. No, that's the way of the flesh. Our weapons, they come from God. And God says that His weapons have divine power to, look at this, demolish the stronghold, not just to put you in recovery. But to demolish them once and for all, we can have the hope that a day is coming in which these strongholds will be yesterday's news, that we will not always live with this struggle, with this prejudice, with this anger, with this wound, with this heart. We need to envision what God can do within us. We want to see our strongholds demolished, do we not? And the picture of Jericho is a picture of what God can do to your Jericho. How does this happen? Well, you keep God in the center. You keep God in the center. Joshua placed the ark and the priest right in the middle of the procession. Everything orbited around God. The priests, the trumpets, the soldiers. Right in the middle was the ark of the covenant. That's what we do. As we press in to our promised land, we do our best to keep God right in the middle. We don't try to take on our stronghold without Him. We don't try to rationalize it. We don't try to dismiss it, deny it. We don't attack it with alcohol, finger pointing, or blame casting. We just keep God center stage. We march by faith knowing that just as Joshua placed soldiers in the front and in the back of the priests, so God has placed angels in front and behind us to protect us. He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. You do not fight alone. You do not. You have God to guide you. You have Jesus to comfort you. You have angels to lead the way, and you're going to like this. You have a ram's horn. A what? You have a ram's horn to blow. The children of Israel had two horns, a silver trumpet and a ram's horn. The silver trumpet was used to call the army into battle. The ram's horn was used to declare a battle already won. So which one did the priests use as they marched around Jericho? Did they call the people into battle? No, they declared the battle was already won. And they marched in faith. They didn't fight for victory. They fought from victory. God told Joshua to fill the air with victory. (laughs) And then he told all the people to stay quiet. Not a word shall proceed out of your mouth. I don't want any chit-chat. I don't want any opinion giving. Nobody backing away saying, what do you think they're doing? Why aren't we doing it this way? Why not that? Why not this? Our own thoughts become our own enemies. And we begin sowing these seeds of destruction among ourselves. Instead of listening to our own opinions, God says, let me take over and let Ram's songs Ram, how do you say this? Ram's horn sounds of victory fill our lives. Where do you get these ram's horns, Max? Well, we don't use ram's horns, but we use scriptures. We use songs of praise. We use words of encouragement. We use declarations of truth. We walk around making declarations like we are more than conquerors through Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We fill our minds with the stories of Jesus and resurrection and walking on water and multiplying bread and the promise of Christ's return. We let the ram's horn hope be loud in our lives. We keep our mouths silent. We don't listen to other naysayers. We avoid discussions, complaints, and grumblings. That's not going to bother the devil and his cohorts, but we blast our ram's horns. 
We sing songs of praise and redemption. We declare, declare scriptures of triumph. We put praise music in our car. We put verses on our windshield. We do everything we can to fill our minds with truth. And as we do, that ground begins to shake. And the walls begin to fall and the demons begin to scatter. I'm imagining those Canaanites as they're looking down from the walls. The first day they made fun of the Israelites. The second day they laughed. Third day, fourth day. I'm thinking they grew a little bit silent. Fifth day, what are these guys up to? Sixth day, and then on the seventh day, they'd never fought a battle like this. I'm thinking about your enemy, the devil. I'm thinking about how he responds as he sees you right here today, pressing into God's Word, giving heed to God's promises, igniting your faith, stirring to fire the flame that is within you, believing that you are a co-heir with Christ, learning to saturate your brain with hope and not negativity, learning that the real battle is not a battle against Republicans or Democrats or the government or the liberals or the conservatives or the economy, but the real battle is against the devil himself. And so you're going to fight against them and against, against Satan and against his followers. And you're learning to pray. You're learning to worship. You're learning to march out of your house every day with hope. You're learning how to replace negative thoughts with hopes of truth. And Satan's beginning to notice. He's beginning to notice because he sees the presence of the living Jesus in your heart. And when he sees that, dear friend, he has no choice but to leave. He cannot remain where Christ is proclaimed. Some time ago, a mother asked me to pray for her eight-year-old son. He was troubled by a constant barrage of negative thoughts, scary visions, and images. He saw people behind cars and in the shadows, and the images left him understandably afraid. They even took his sleep at night. On the day that we met, he appeared defeated. While his other siblings were confident and happy, his smile was gone. There's no joy in his face, and his eyes often filled with tears as he clung to the side of his mother. She told me about the frightening thoughts. They had taken him to doctors and psychiatrists, and nothing had helped. Would I be willing to pray for him? I told the young boy what I've been telling you, that the real battle in life takes place in our thoughts, but that the devil has no authority over our lives. And that God will help us take every single thought captive. I told him about spiritual weapons of prayer, of worship, and of Scripture. And I urged him to memorize a Bible verse and quote it each time a fearful thought surfaced. And I gave him this exercise. I said, take your hand and reach up and grab that frightening thought and just yank it out of your head and throw it in the trash. And before it has time to come back, you fill that thought with a promise from God. You fill it with a verse from the Bible. We practiced. He did it. We prayed for him. We anointed him with oil. Five days later, his mother reported great progress. She sent me this email. Since last week, the images are gone. He's no longer seeing them. He's doing well in school. He's enjoying reading the book of Genesis. God gave us Psalm 25, 5. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all day. He recites this verse nightly. This has brought him closer to Christ, and he uses the strategy of throwing the thoughts away in the trash can. He said when he tried to throw them away, his head would hurt. I said, what made them go away? And he smiled and said, I know God made them go away. Another Jericho bites the dust. Resist the devil. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The advantage that a young person has is faith faith. They are quick to obey. An eight-year-old has a childlike spirit that does not believe they are destined to live with these strongholds. 
the challenge that some of you have is these strongholds have dominated you for decades. And you've just assumed, well, they're just a part of who you are. They're not. They're not. Envision a new version of you. Envision a new, better version of you. God is not finished with you yet. You'll know He's finished when you take a final breath. Between now and then, He has high plans to change your way of thinking, to alter your way of seeing. And you may have been a bigot all of your life, but you don't have to be a bigot the rest of your life. Or you may have been a womanizer all of your life, but you don't have to be a womanizer the rest of your life. Nothing is set in stone. God can break the patterns that you learned from your parents, the patterns that you've picked up from society. He can break all that, and he can create within you a new person. But he won't until you believe him, until you have the faith of that eight-year-old boy, until you begin imagining, if I resist the devil, he's going to flee from me. You say, well, Max, I have been trying, and I've been trying a long, long time. I would imagine some of the Hebrews thought that as well. They marched that first day, that second day, that third day. Did you note as you read Joshua chapter 6 that Joshua did not tell the Hebrews how many days they would march around the city? God told Joshua how many days. He knew it was a seven-day assignment. I don't know why Joshua didn't tell that to the people. For all they knew, they'd be marching around the city for years. He didn't tell them. And Jesus our Joshua hasn't told us how long it's going to take either. He just tells us to keep marching. But we know this. He told us to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We just keep marching. For all you know, you're just one lap away from something like this. On the seventh day, they rose early about the dawning of the day, and they marched around the city seven times in the same manner. And the seventh time it happened. When the priests blew the trumpets, that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And so the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Then the people took the city. And the very walls that kept them out became stepping stones over which they could walk and enter into the city. May God do the same with your Jericho. Move from untrue premises into divine promises. Take those thoughts and pull them out. Envision a new version of you. By the way, what happened in Jericho is going to happen again. Our Joshua, Jesus Christ, is going to signal for an angel to blast a trumpet. And at that time, everything's going to shake. The world as we know it is going to change. And all the evil that has brought hunger and famine and rape and hurt into this world, the devil and all of his underlings are going to be forever cast away into an eternal punishment. And God will establish a new kingdom right here, right here. Till then, there's going to be a fight. There's going to be a battle. But we know who has won. And we're going to press into him, aren't we? And trust him to bring down the Jerichos in our life. Amen. So, Lord, thank you for this reminder. We trust you now. We pray, Father, that whatever it is that you've quickened in our hearts today, we would heed we would learn. Don't let us forget what you're teaching us, please. Protect these truths in our minds. Let us see ourselves in a new way, Father. Help us to press into your promises and be people of victory. We offer this prayer through Jesus Christ and all who agreed with it said...